уважаемые коллеги. Уважаемые коллеги, приветствуем участников конференции «Авторско-правовые проблемы в сфере промышленной собственности». Инициатива и идея конференции моего самодератора Федотова Михаила Александровича, заведующего кафедрой ЮНЕСКО Высшей школы экономики, исполнение, исполнение наше совместное с участием а, и других субъектов а, этих взаимоотношений. Мы а, видим, что эта конференция а, а, должна дать ответы на целый ряд вопросов и вызвала хороший, здоровый интерес в разных кругах. У нас участники подключены из 24 регионов. В офлайн формате участвуют 62 человека из Рязани, Нижнего Новгорода, Перми, Санкт-Петербурга, Москвы, Московской области, других регионов. Мы особенно благодарим героев этого участия. Нам очень важно что не только онлайн-режим, но и офлайн режим мы используем в конференции. Из восьми стран участвуют 36 зарубежных участников. Приветствую коллег из Азербайджана, Белоруссии и Таджикистана, коллег глав патентных ведомств. Приветствую также коллег из Казахстана, Киргизии, Молдовы, Узбекистана, Соединенных Штатов Америки. Докторов и кандидатов наук 60 человек среди наш, в нашей конференции. А, уверен, научный уровень будет обеспечен этими звучными именами, которые у нас в программе. Их а, многолетней работы над проблемами авторского права и мы очень это ценим. Отмечаю, что 14 патентных поверенных вместе с нами. Я думаю, что практические работники, которые хорошо знают в Роспатенте и в судебной системе скажут свое веское слово, и мы это делаем. Из всех проблем, которые у нас стоят, хотел бы отметить несколько. И первое – это стимулирование авторов изобретений. Право авторства. А кардинальное право, право, которое связано с, именно с творческим вкладом, постоянно находится в рисковой сфере. В рисковой сфере. Это проблема патентной активности в нашей стране. Она не решена. Мы видим, A certain regulation has been adopted, which has approved the situation the authors are live, uh, live in. But we like to see fundamental proposals. We like to justify proposals on how to encourage authors. If we succeed in this, then it will promote intellectual property in Russia grandly, uh, both in Russia and worldwide. We are waiting for all sorts of proposals, even the most fundamental ones. Rospatent has many times said that we would like to see a special program for millionaire professors, millionaire inventors. We suggest that the rights not only, uh, not of inventors, not only when they trust the rights to be protected, but also the rights during the production process. We offer these 10% royalty from any product made on the basis of the patent protected at our service, with the authors named in this patent. The authors are the ones who can promote their product most of all. Роспатент well. Вы знаете, что в общем в предмет экспертизы это не входит, и в законодательстве нет этого даже требования полномасштабного. Но у нас нет соответствующих баз данных. Те платформы, которые создали, а депонирование, которое производит РАО, его недостаточно для того, чтобы определить использование фрагментов подчас произведений в том или ином товарном знаке или в промообразце. Особенно, конечно, нам важно понять, He wants to understand how design 
and copyright can be combined. At the same time, the policy of Ross Patent is that we protect copyright. And as we were getting prepared with countries, my colleague said that we, we can protect the internet and the knowledge of experts. But this is not enough for Ross Patent to be able to protect copyright. This caused lots of court proceedings. And wherever there are strong legal teams, for instance, for instance in the case of a Soyuz multifilm, where they were willing to protect their copyright, we saw that they have been able to protect their copyright in dozens of cases. And this resulted in hundreds of millions of rubles in revenues for Soyuz multifilm and the authors of these cartoons. We see that the cartoon characters are protected, but to see when they ca these characters can be protected, this has been elevated all the way to the constitutional court to identify the positions of all the parties. Clearly, there are lots of such cases. Uh, we need to be able to foresee them and to offer proper solutions. That said, the authors are quite interested in protecting uh, uh, their, uh, their marks. This is the purpose of design. And we see such indicator as, for instance, the Fyodor Bondarchuk. This trademark, this, this film director, this film actor has submitted an application to protect this copyright. And we know that there are lots of people, talented people, who would like to protect their talent, protect their creative contribution, and to use it for the benefit of Russia. We also know how many pop groups started. Now, people want to protect their rights. So it's not only about what's going on as patent. It's also about a regulatory function that must be provided for at the area when, uh, where these relations should be regulated. Uh, we don't think that the government has a priority here. Ethical regulation, corporate regulation maybe have an even higher importance with respect. But to this end, we need to provide information informational opportunities, so that any author could use all these regulatory measures. We hope that after the government information systems are introduced, and this is going to be this year, any author would be able online, in an automated manner, to obtain all the information about all the activities of Ross Patents. They will know how their rights are protected, who has been trying to infringe them, and they would be able to participate in this process of protection. So what we care about is not only the form of inter interrelation, so pre-registration of uh, uh, such uh, uh, industrial designs are quite important. We'll prepare a draft law after this conference to be able to discuss this at the government. And we encourage all the participants of the conference to come up with their opinions, maybe even to encourage Ross Patent and other government authorities to start solving this problem, to look for legal solutions, procedural solutions. This will improve the situation with the copyrights extensively. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to thank you one more time for finding time to participate in this conference. And now I would like to give floor to the chief driver of this conference, Mikhail Fedotov. We all know him. He's an outstanding fighter for author rights. We all know that he has taken positions in the government and the administration of the president, but still, he still cared about our problems. I know this from a personal experience. We worked together, we proposed various solutions, and Mikhail approved of them, or criticized them for that matter, or helped to, help to promote them, helped to make them implementable. So, Mikhail, please something very important and very good. Thank you, dear colleagues. Dear colleagues, I would like to begin by extending a world of thanks both to the management of Rospatin, but also to the people at Rospatin who have helped to organize this conference. A very big thank to all of you. You have done a lot of very important work. 
I didn't even expect that we would be able to hold this excellent event. I thought, oh, well, maybe we will be like 15 people. And uh, we would exchange our, our opinions over Zoom, and that would be it. But you see, it's totally different. As I, as I was approaching the building of patent, I saw a big poster in the street that said International Conference uh, 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 Legal Right in the Area of Industrial Design. So, a very well organized conference, a very well organized conference. And the fact that it's being held both in English and in Russian, both for Russian colleagues and international colleagues, is also very important. The fact that it's being broadcast on YouTube. So anybody who's interested in this area of problems can join in and can listen and can watch. So again, thank you very much to all those who were involved in the organization of this conference. And now, about the gist of this idea, of the problem we're discussing. As we were discussing this conference together with my colleague Grigori, we proceeded from a very small-scale topic, copyright and trademarks. How do they overlap? Well, it's quite clear. And clear that this cross-regulation causes certain problems. But then, on the other hand, I will show in my report how this cross-regulation gives positive results as well. But the problems do exist, we need to discuss them, and clearly we need to look for various ways to solve them. Among other things, we need to offer solutions in the legal sphere and in the law enforcement area. But then we saw that we were looking at, at the problem from a two low level. We said, just wait a second. But in addition to trademarks, there are also uh, uh, industrial designs. Uh, this is already a work of design. And design is also a copyright asset. How could we forget about them? And then we began to expand the topic of the conference. And we brought all the way to the existing level. Mm. Le legal and authorized in the area of industrial property. But I will show in my report, this is not, in, not only about trademarks, and not only about industrial designs, but it, it goes on and on and on. But I will not put the card before the horse and tell you what I'm going to tell you tell in my report. Now, very briefly, in conclusion, I would like to say that I find it very good that we see our colleagues joining us from other countries, both heads of patent services from a whole lot of our neighbors, neighboring countries, but also scholars and experts from various countries. This is very good, and we will use this opportunity to exchange our experience in how these problems are tackled in various countries. Because we all know very well that intellectual property and the copyright is based on international rights, on international conventions. And these conventions create a base on one hand, and on the other hand, they restrict, they limit international, uh, sorry, national initiatives. This means that we start to need thinking about what proposals we could make, what initiatives we could launch at the international level. Uh, not only we could, but also we should launch at the international level to be able to develop this international legal sphere in the area of copyright. Thank you. Thank you. This brings my presentation to an end, and I would like to give the floor back to Grigori. Thank you, Mikhail. One more thing I would like to remind to all of you, dear participants. My colleague has proposed to publish all these reports. Thank you for providing us the text. If you would like to improve them, if you have provided these texts, yes, you have this opportunity now. Because I think that we will publish the proceedings of this conference in not just in one issue, but a number of issues of our magazine. So please 
turn to Mikhail and we will definitely be happy to receive your publication. Dear colleagues, the Federation Council is with us as always. Solv solving issues of copyright protection is an area we, we, which, which we discuss with the Council of, on Copyright at the Federation Council. And Today we have Lilia Gomerova, head of the Committee for Science, Education and Culture from the Russian Federation Council. On behalf of the Committee of the Council of Federation of Education and Science, I would like to extend my heartfelt greetings to all the participants of this national conference. Corporate legal issues in the national conference. The topic of intellectual property and the solid legal base for this topic is in the focus of the Federation Council. Where the Council for Development of Intellectual Property has been working several years under the close monitoring of the head of the Federation Council целый we'll ряд законодательных инициатив в этом направлении. Это и закон о предварительном информационном поиске, ратификация договора о товарных знаках, протокол об охране промышленных образцов. Большую работу совместно с Роспатентом мы провели по выявлению, а также правовой охране таких объектов интеллектуальной собственности, как наименование места происхождения товара, географические указания. Origin and other aspects. We see today another very important area. We need to implement the roadmap proposed by the Russian government in order to transform the business climate in the area of cooperation. The issues and projects that you are going to discuss today in this conference definitely will contribute to identification of new IP assets. To creation of a strong legal platform and the implementation of both plans. I would like to wish all the participants of this conference a productive, very fruitful work, good health, and new interesting projects. Thank you, Lilia. Thank you very much. We have. Heads of the International Head of Federation Director General of the National Center of Intellectual Property of the Republic of Belarus, Vladimir Rabovolov. He's going to join us over the video conference. Good morning, dear participants and guests of the conference. On behalf of the National Center of Intellectual Property of the Republic of Belarus, I would like to say that it is a special honor for me to participate in this large conference. I would like to extend our thanks to the Federal Government and to Grigory Ilyev and the Chair of UNESCO on copyright and neighboring cultural information of the NRU High School of Economics and to Mikhail Fedotov, Director of this Chair, for organizing this conference in these very difficult times. The Republic of Belarus provides full-scale support to your initiatives and admits that it is necessary to offer a federal environment for our country to be able to implement these laws both at the national but also at international levels. Issues touched upon in this conference have been getting more and more important from year to year, which shows that the system uh, IP has been developing and its, its various elements have been integrated into all the areas of our life against the background of global transformation. The creative potential of a man knows no limits, and it is the main driver of social and economic progress.
In view of this, we see that it is more and more necessary to offer the pr proper protection of IP results, uh, uh, in particular in terms of improving of the legal base. The National Center of Intellectual Property is not only the patent service of the Republic of Belarus. It also carries out the functions of collective management of copyrights in Belarus. It works uh, 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 on the border between copyright and uh, patent rights. Just like Ross Patent, we deal with a whole lot of various issues related in, in particular to encouragement of uh, authors initiatives and to their creative work. I'm convinced that this international conference will, bec will become an effective site for exchange the, uh, of experience in the area of copyright and patent rights and will help to develop the most effective mechanisms aimed to protect the rights in the area of science, literature, creative work and industrial design. I wish all the participants of this conference fruitful work in interesting discussions and, and you achievements in this area. Vladimir, thank you very much. We find it very important that all the problems have also an integration, a Eurasian Euro aspect to them. So, now I'd like to invite uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Ismail Zadar Mirzo, director of, the, director of the National Center for Patents and Information of the Ministry of the Economic Development of Tajikistan. Mr. Ismail Zadar is also chair of the Administrative Council of the Eurasian Patent Organization. Mr. Ismail Zadar, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear participants and guests of the International Conference, I would like to extend my special thanks to the Federal Property of Intellectual Property of the Russian Federation and to the head of the Ross Patent, Grigor Ivlev, for inviting me to participate in this conference to discuss this very topical issue of collisions between industrial property rights and copyrights. We see that the role of intellectual property has been growing today, in particular with respect to long-term social and economic development of the countries. At the same time, we see that problems are related to illegal use of IP assets have been getting more and more acute. This is why discussion of these topical issues will help us to resolve lots of issues in this respect. I am from the Patent Service of the Republic of Tajikistan. The system of copyright protection that was created after the Republic became independent has been developing and improving. This system helps us to ensure proper protection of copyright assets and the existing laws are in, in law in compliance with international standards. The Republic has made some progress in this respect in the past years. Still, we're facing a number of difficulties and problems. These prevent us from further integration of copyright and intellectual property rights into the national economy. Our patent authority has been working quite successfully with the Ross patent that have been providing us very significant expert support. In particular, this February we have signed a memorandum on the cooperation between our two services, Ross Patent and the Patent Service of Tajikistan. This memorandum covered access to the patent search system offered by Ross Patent. Ross Patent at the moment is taking the lead in this area. They use state-of-the-art technologies such as blockchain, AI, and other information technologies. In other words, they've been transforming approach to IP protection, which is a very good example for all our services in the CIS. The conference will be a hallmark event for all the specialists representing IP field. There are no doubt will be very beneficial to a better understanding of the nature of conflicts in industrial property and copy rights, and it will also provide for the incentives in order to accelerate our efforts in this respect. So I believe so the organization delivery of such conferences is truly important. 
important because it provides us with opportunity to share our experience and to provide information. So I would like to extend my gratitude to all the organizers, and I would like to wish all the participants and organizers alike a very constructive dialogue and a very effective interaction. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Mirzoy Maldon, for your welcoming remarks and for your warm attitude. So we are truly appreciative of that. And on that, we would like to start our substantive part that will include several reports and that this is going to be the first plenary session consisting of several presentations and the first one will be delivered by Professor Mikhail Fedotov on the theme of authorship as the primary source of individualization and a result of intellectual activity. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, distinguished colleagues. So, uh, my topic will be about the authorship as a basis of entire ecosystem for the protection of um, IP assets. So, we'll be looking at this ecosystem as authorship sensulata. That is, in a broad sense of this word. So the authorship as such extends beyond uh, the uh, copyright in its uh, very strict word, which is strict center. And intellectual property includes the legal protection of the results of intellectual activity and also the means of individualization that are equated with the form. No doubt that any result of any intellectual activity will bear a, a, a creator or an author that created such a result, and this is, goes to Article from the civil code, and it applies to all the results of intellectual activity. On the other hand, so the lawmaker some books the role of an author, and which I will dwell on with greater detail later. So now let's uh, go back to those means of individualization that also have their authors. And if we look at trademark marks or commercial names and uh, indications, we see that it doesn't have a link to author, but we see that in practice, so this all goes with individualization, and there are authors or creators behind all those assets or the people that would have this creative idea then transform it into a big viewers or probably into substantial uh, part that is application that will be filed with the patent agency and brand as such is a kind of mental construct and it will be result of intellectual activity in all the instances. So now let's look at the position of the lawmaker. So the lawmaker doesn't see um, an author uh, as taking part in the results of intellectual activity and know-how in particular. So this author and the legal construct that applies to know-how going to trade or commercial secrets, including this information of any nature that will be of of value because they are not known to third parties. True, if you take a list of, a, say, customer base or a cleaning service, so it doesn't get you a good, better idea of so some, something secret. But if you get the phonogram of sea waves, then you can get this result. But the, at the same time, the two things, the sea waves meter and also the list of customers Customers, so the two categories will be considered as results of intellectual activity under the existing Russian legislation. Hence, there should be authors behind those results. Next, we look at the civil code that goes closer to the trademark, and that the know-how, if know-how is created by someone as part of their job, so that means that 
The role of, author, of authors should be enshrined in the legislation. Probably we will have to revise the entire construct or definition that is applied by the lawmakers to this very uh, term of know-how and the way it is uh, regulated currently. If we move on the slide number three that, that provides us with a classification and that is tighter or the factors that define authorship so that the maximum from going from minimum to maximum maximum level would include um, authorship copyright patent and then we see trademark and then we go down to geographical indications which is minimum then we can reach this zero level for uh, geographical indications and also places of origin of goods and as in certain instances if you look at the geographical indication it is possible to identify an author so whenever places are in your name there should be a person behind this so there should be someone that puts forward an idea or a preposition to change the name of a place next so these are intangible rights and these uh, rights should not be alienable, alienable, so withdrawal is null and void, and the term of protection is not, not unlimited. So it is the author that's the primary source for the right to the result of intellectual activity. We look at it as an alpha and omega of the entire system of intellectual property that is in place. Therefore, we are suggesting that the following formula should be used. So when the author creating um, an asset, so the creation, so the creation also creates an author. So these are two intertwined and uh, the, the author is and the higher expectations as related to his her creations but in the absence of any creations there is no author behind it and this is this very principle that we decided to use uh, unfortunately so one uh, one part of the site is blocked by another and uh, we cannot see clearly the scheme the scheme that uh, provides this loop like author uh, creation user and then it goes back to the author so at our chair the unesco center for copyright we have this principle that everyone who has um, uh, some intellectual capacity will get a result in terms of ownership because as for the individualization and if we look at the authorship then historically it comes as the first tool of individualization so this slide shows a very interesting object that of historical significance and by the way I've spotted it in the Hermitage and that's the bilingual, bilingual boss because it includes two colors black and orange and it's uh, 520 before uh, our time so it's uh, quite ancient and it is uh, symbolic because if we look at the center of it there is a raining when and it says as he his hill did it and then you look at the animal and uh, it says that Epictet drew a picture and uh, the idea is that this asset is the result of the of the creation of two authors the one so who produced who made the object and the other one who painted it so obviously it in terms of property rights it has the same meaning and we are talking about the sixth century before DC and then it's just there are hundreds of vases and many museums around the world and we see that epicated and there's a painted 
lots of them. So there's, there can be no doubt about the authorship of this inscription or drawing, and it was a common thing back then. So, and if we look at uh, the items that were pr produced by Atakim and Theme and others, so they also did the same thing, it's like in rem rights. So that's the uh, object that they created that is of specific use to household and the, the same importance can be also attached to the mark that was uh, that was made on animal skins. And if we look in the ancient Rome literature, we can trace the same origins of authorship. For instance, Marcel. So I would like to quote him on this slide. So when addressing his colleague Fidentin, he wrote that, so I was told that you are just presenting my writings in the way if you were the real author. So if you just, uh, uh, if you recognize my authorship, I will give it to you for free. But if you don't recognize, if you tell the people that these are yours, you will have to pay for it. So these are the very first dealings involving the sale of authorship. So it's not the copyright, but authorship, which is not very feasible under the current legislation. But back to the inscription. So the idea was just to make people remember to the one who, who produced uh, the objects. And it is in line with this ethics of aspiration. It is a very common to the Greek people because it's all about the prevalence and this perfection, the behavior of a person that tries to make the best out of the situation and to have the conduct that is appropriate to the conditions in place. And that there is another example of Ephemid's inscription that said that Ephemid, the son of Palamis, drew this so in a way that Euphrony could never have done that. So that's yet another proof of, um, of authorship. And we see that uh, many years have elapsed and this link between the authors and this beautiful boss is still there. And you can go and visit uh, this Hermitage Museum and see it for yourself. And now let's um, try and make this hypothetical case. So we take this vase and we try and replicate it. So in that situation, we see that all this inscription will be turned into a tool of individualization of both the, of the, the producer and the author, because the two will be merged uh, in, in one. So this very indication of, of authorship will have all the functions of a trademark. So it just, if we follow the formulation, the language of the contemporary legislation, so we see that authors are at the center of the ecosystem and there should be the monopoly that provides for recognition of the results of intellectual activity and entails also the tools of individualization. So this approach will uh, enable us to identify both conflicts and law and also some benefits as to the individualization of authorship. And I several examples or case studies from our chair. So it was in 2000, in the year 2000, and there was an entrepreneur from um, St. Petersburg, so who engaged in beer production that was Windows 99. Obviously, that looked as a very non-fair competition towards Windows. And it turned out that the trademark of Windows did not cover this 30, uh, class, class 32 in the classification system. 
And therefore, our chair decided to deal with the case in a slightly different way, not from the perspective of the trademark, but rather from the perspective of the authorship. And then we see that software can be equated with the works of literature. And now we prove that software can be also separate uh, object of protection in the same way that literary works can be protected. Hence, we see this very infringement of the exclusive right to alteration and also replication of the copyright that is protected. And then same principle applies to the label that we analyzed and also made a comparison with the Microsoft Windows official logo. And the law enforcement authorities were on our side. They corroborated with our position and therefore this infringement was um, discontinued. When we take individualization as real tools, then we can also design new approaches towards a new IP assets that are under development that will be emerging in the market and the markets of the Stockholm uh, con Convention on VIP or establishment, so it includes an open list of IP assets and also it extends its application to all the results of intellectual activity, be it production, literature work, or works of art, and we have 1225 uh, article in the civil court that gives us this closed list of IP assets. But if, they, if we open up the list, then it will enable us to seek some judicial ways to protect domain names and media names, account names and social network and all and social media and all these other things that are not included in the scope of 1225 article of the civil code. Therefore, the legislator would get this very time proven, a practice proven model that could then enshrined in the civil legislation. So the IP felt and it just demonstrates that it's Einstein statement that, that the works well, that imagination is more important than knowledge, that knowledge is restricted. Meanwhile, your imagination extends throughout the, the world. And then we see this huge progress that has been achieved by the humanity over the years. So all these things that are present today, they are thanks to the efforts of imagination and creation of our predecessors. And all these things that we are going to have in the future, they will be also created through our imagination and creation. There's the shortage of time that the, back in the last century, in the 80s years, there was a, an idea put forward to extend protection to software in the similar way that literary works were protected. And Ulner theory was taken by the academia that the memory of a computer can be equated with the demonstration of creation and replication of creation that, that, that according to Ulmer, so software can be seen as a script. So therefore, so the substance should be protected by copyright. As the information technologies develop, we have been seeing more and more riddles offered by this construct. For instance, we all know that a computer program which equals the literary work in our view can create musical works. What legal characteristics should we give to this process? Shouldn't we in this case believe that this musical work created by a computer program is a derivative of a literary work? While we see between the musical work and the computer work no no things in the commons at all. So, I encourage you, dear colleagues, in view of this, to use the piece of advice offered by Albert Einstein and to put your consciousness out of the box to, to see new mechanism of legal approach of legal protection where it is basically important to observe the principles 
that uh, offer a foundation for corporate sense alata, the co corporate in the broad sense of this word, the entire system of intellectual property protection. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, Mikhail. Absolutely excellent. So you have been able to convince all of you that uh, that uh, uh, ad admitting a copyright is uh, the, the best instrument that encourages the author. It has both its ethical aspects, but it also offers the, uh, the property aspect, and you have been able to cover this all very well. With your permission, we will use the slides for lectures to our students. So, you know, I feel uh, like I should start my lectures from sixth age, uh, six. Uh, uh, 600 years BC rather than the first patent, as we have been doing this uh, up till now. Dear colleagues, now I would like to give floor to uh, Kamran Imranov, Chairman of the Board of Intellectual Property Agency of the Republic of Azerbaijan. The, the department will discuss the link between copyright and patent law. M Mr. Imranov uh, is well known not only as chair of the patent service of his country, but also he is one of the few heads of patent services who has published a whole lot of various works in this top, on this topic. And we find it very important that a head of patent service and a renowned scholar, authoritative legal scholar, is attending our conference. Mr. Imanov, you have the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear friends, dear organizers, Mr. Ivlev, Mr. Fedotov, I would like to thank you for this invitation to participate in this outstanding international forum. It is a special honor and a privilege for me to speak on behalf of the Agency for Intellectual Property of the Republic of Azerbaijan to all of you. But my special thanks go, go to Professor Fedotov for the very topical initiative in the area of copyright protection. I should say that as an expert in this area, I've been very deeply impressed by his speech today, the, the depth, the new ideas offered in this report. I would like to thank Professor Fedotov for introducing a new concept, the authorship as the source of individualization of the results of intellectual work. This is indeed a historical uh, landmark. And I should say that Professor Fedotov is not the only one who thinks so. We have seen in many speeches offered by many of our colleagues, of, and who have raised this topic as well for many years, that all, copyright is a locomotive that drives the entire system of intellectual property. And authorship is the most important attribute of the system. And all people who came to, into this system of intellectual property from auth or copyright thinks this way. I've also migrated here from the, auth from the copyright system, so to say. And I would like to say that we would like to thank that Azerbaijani poets back in the Middle Ages, when there was no concept of copyright in the present day sense of this word, still they would write the name of the author of the poet in the very last lines of their poem. In the Azerbaijan, the term was Atap Sharma. So it was a special information about who was the author of this poem. And if you look at poems by our outstanding poet, Nizami Fizuri and others, you will see that uh, uh, there's a, a Atap Sharma at the end of each poem, and this plays a very special role. And it was the asset of copyright, which we're discussing here. And, you know, usually we say that the right creates the, the obligation. And we think it's also that the obligation creates the right. And the, the obligation of an outstanding 
expert in this area has resulted in the fact that we're going to deal with the new concept and we'll be happy in our activities. Dear colleagues, the present day understanding of intellectual property and the function of this institution differ a lot from the traditional perception caused by outstanding technical changes. These changes have and will continue influencing the existing landscape in the area of intellectual property. This is important because we need to understand the future evolution of intellectual property and its international application. It is also very important that intellectual property would not prevent this from developing, but rather adapt to it, because it cannot prevent. This phenomenon has been developing in accordance with its own laws. Yes, this is all true. Still, we need to believe that it is critically important to understand from the institutional point of view and to strengthen the category of intellectual property. We believe that present day categories of intellectual property have been developing not only exclusive rights of individual of individuals and corporations to the results of intellectual property work have been developing, but even the results have been developing. Because what what is in demand in the market is not the rights but the results of intellectual work that bear the rights and deals with these assets clearly take into account the scope of provision of the rights to this particular result of intellectual property. So the synergy which lies in the Institute of Intellectual Property or, or the emergency that calls not only to understand the right, but also to understand the economic and sociological aspects of this work. This raises the problem. We need to offer a one platform for industrial design, industrial property and copyright. Just look for yourselves. Without commercializing property, you cannot offer any innovations. Uh, this is an, a very important part of industrial design, industrial property. Uh, this also leaves outside the social effect and the economic component. Institutional, institutional reforms carried out by our leadership, the Agency of Intellectual Property of Azerbaijan, manages all the areas of intellectual property in Azerbaijan. And our EGs are not only copyright or industrial property, but also other aspects of intellectual properties. Patent information, re re records, co copyright, co cultural assets, and traditional knowledge are protected. While three sectors are under our uh, management, the Center for Industrial Property, the Center for Protection of Copyrights, and our patent library. Furthermore, 10 days ago, the President ordered to create the Center for Commercialization and Transfer of Technologies. It is very important and we will focus on this a lot. As an expert, I can see very clearly the effect related to the segregation of uh, area of knowledge, but then with the combination of this, these areas. The, the, the cross-fertilization helps to in increase this work. We have a lot to learn from each other. For instance, where voluntary registration of copyright assets is legal, you can also use the procedure of registration used for industrial assets, such as computer programs or results of IT work but also various scientific works or correct uh, uh, processing of application to register an industrial uh, uh, corporate asset reduces the risks of the abuse in, in one way or another. Furthermore, a retroactive protection uh, relieves the problems that we see be, uh, pro, pro problems in this uh, area. 
but uh, I'll discuss this later on. In my speech, I would like to focus on two major problems. These issues we have touched upon many times. One, how, how can corporate influence patent laws, and what can we offer as measures to make to bring them closer? Two, the influence of copyright in case of overlapping of the rights of copyright and the right to industrial design, you know, trade, tra trade, trademarks. So, raising awareness of the public about patents and notifying the public about patents should be a special priority. We should offer printed information, we should publish bulletins, we should tell the public about applications. But we need to comply with one important condition. We need to see the link between patent law and copyright. The fact is that patent applications, we are convinced, are also a corporate asset. Yes, a corporate asset is created without, well, there are three conditions. It has an objective value, it, 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 it is unique, and it is legal. The first condition is always observed when the application is filed, because it is filed to the patent service on paper form or electronically, which means it is objective. Condition number two is also observed, and nobody can claim that uh, uh, this application is not creative work. And three, uh, it, only, it is only true when there's a derivative. So this application fully complies with the conditions of protection of copyright. And this, in view of this, a corporate application is also a piece of corporate asset that should be protected. So we see that this corporate originates on the principles of automatic corporate. Corporate to an application occurs from the time an application is filed all the way through the moment it is registered. Filling in the documents to obtain such a, a registration means that on one hand it, is, it exists in the objective form and it is also published. So under the rules of copyright, so any uh, asset can be used only with the permission from either uh, an author or the right holder. But, however, the copies can be disseminated among a limited number of persons. So, and when applications, whether they can be used without any permission, that is based on the doctrine of fair use. But we all know that this doctrine is based on this three-part uh, te test. Uh, that stems from Rome Convention, and this test is well known to all the stakeholders, and we see that it's all about the general nature of the right, but as for limitations, those will imply in specific instances when these, these limitations will not restrict any infringement on the legitimate interest of the author in this three-step test rule has the following consequences. When an application is published without any permission, uh, then we have uh, damages as a re the result. Next, uh, author's rights, whether infringed in terms of uh, patents, can be remedied, for instance, by publishing the documents that have been filled in properly by the author. It can be published with the permission 
of the letter. And there is another way to secure the right that the application can be published prior to the issues of patent, and that's the practice that has been followed in the United States. So these are the problems that are linked to patent use. And in the United States, they have this prime, this first to file application or the primary application that will be published. I mean, for um, in order to disseminate information, and uh, the primary application will proceed. The general application that will be filed within 12 months. Then there is yet another problem that is the term of protection of a patent, and be it patent laws or IP law, so we look at the protection of personal rights and intangible rights, while intangible rights or pecuniary rights will be protected for uh, a specified term of time, and that will be 20 years after the date of filing that the period which can be further extended for five years, that's um, inventions. So invention have no protection before publication, but when publication comes and then the patent is registered within the official gazette, so there will be temporary protection afforded to the patent. However, the legislation is, does not provide specific explanation as to this temporary period of protection, where the third parties will have to provide remuneration to the patent holder or if we are talking about payments, will, will be considered as a pecuniary, pecuniary right on the side of uh, the patent holder. So these are the issues that are not regulated in the legislation, but in other instances uh, can be stated where the patent holder, for example, will be using a their patents, so they will not have to pay, but if these are the third parties and the third parties using the patent that will be protected in the future, so that's another situation. But uh, if you have another uh, case where someone would be using a patent, I mean, if it has been obtained in a proper way, but then during the temporary period of protection, so some remuneration will have to be paid, and also there is this issue of retroactivity. And uh, in many countries, this retroactive principle is not valid in the legislation. So except for some instances where the question of responsibility is brought in dispute, so then patent law can also um, conflict with some constitutional principles in terms of temporary protection, because temporary protection can be then viewed as a retroactive expansion of the rights. And this time period of protection will be extended from the date of filing with the patent agency but before the point in time when the information becomes published with the agency. And it's the burn, burn convention via pro agreements for copyright and phonograms so that the principle has been enshrined and the idea is whenever you join the Vienna uh, Union, the Vienna Convention, then you will be affording protection also to all those assets of the countries that are members to the Convention and also to those assets um, that are active in the countries and that have not expired yet. So and this is also should be somehow coordinated with the national legislation and international rules. And I, the, I do believe that we need to be very specific about the term of protection within this period after the date of filing and prior to the date of uh, publication. So and this is something, the area which we're trying to develop and improve uh, in our legislation. Now I'd like to do a dive into conflict on laws. So the conflict of law we uh, take as um, some conflict in terms of protection, and we have these products that can be protected by various um, 
and legal regimes. So uh, that could be some overlapping of regulation, for instance, or we see that one regulation, one framework can overlap with another. So if you have smartphone, like mobile phones, and that there can be another type of contact of laws when you get an IP asset that can enjoy protection in various jurisdictions, and that will be called overlapping protection based on jurisdiction. So these are the two categories. And now I would like to focus on the second category, because whenever several jurisdictions are involved, you need to opt for one or another in order to ensure the regime of better protection. So that's conflict of laws as part of the second category a bit contradictory in the first place. But they also can provide benefits to the right holder, and they can Mm, on the one hand, uh, provide opportunities to some legal acts, uh, but on the other hand, they can also prevent um, undue influence or use. So, and uh, we see that it also applies to the exercise of rights in the first place. I'll give you an example. So there is uh, the right holder that gives his permission to use uh, his drawing as a trademark. Then a trademark is produced, and it's the, the authors, the author of the drawings also can also provide their permission to industrial design. So we take trademark versus industrial design, and there's certainly a linkage between the two. And, uh, we wouldn't claim compensation ba based on a legal use of an IP right. So, but in addressing this question, we need to first clarify whether we can have this simultaneous protection that is based bo both on patent law and trademark law. So in the previous years, that kind of opportunity was not provided for in the current legislation. But currently, we do have this sort of parallel jurisdictions or parallel um, frameworks of uh, legal protection. For instance, so that's the patent agency in the United States, so that they are dealing with patents and also with all the issues related to conflicts of law. So industrial design can be protected by copyrights. And to do so, an applicant has to file an application and provide a notice of copyright. And the right holder, so the copyright holder, should also declare that it, they have no objections against including that uh, uh, indication in the filing and the against, uh, and they have no objection against the way the trademark is presented or described or in, the, in the application. So, and the, in any way, we need to prevent all legitimate acts, and there are judicial mechanisms that I will not dwell upon, but we do have the doctrine on the restriction of rights uh, regarding transfer of rights, the doctrine of hierarchy, and other relevant doctrines that can be applied in the jurisprudence. So authorship and uh, copyright. So copyright, whenever industrial designs or trademarks are registered, and if, if a permission is not secured from the author, then the author can bring a challenge against this kind of use to, before the court. And um, I would like to now give you a couple of other case studies. For instance, we have a collision between copyright and industrial design. So there is this object of copyright versus an object of industrial design. So we take an object that wants to, that um, uh, is to be registered, and it, this can be protected, protected either as an industrial design or if it is to be used by third parties, then the applicant, when filing, should secure a permission from the author. So if there is no copyright, then an application, in his application, so also the applicant can become the, the holder of the object. So industrial 
design rights prevail over exclusive copyright. So exclusive copyright infringement will be cons will be taken um, into consideration and resolution only in the case of whether there are no infringement on industrial designs. And there are certain criteria. Criteria, criteria number one will be original or that individual nature. So original should be original in terms of aesthetic features. That's for copyright. But as we look at industrial designs on this side, it should be new or novel. And therefore, so industrial designs can be used along with a copyright object. And therefore, if we protect industrial designs, that will automatically protect the copyright. And this is one of the considerations that the courts would defer to. Next, copyright can also clash with the right to trademark. Say there is an object that is to be registered as a trademark, and if a copyright is held by a third party, then the applicant for trademark registration should secure, again, or should seek permission from the right holder. And if there is no author, then in the process of application for a trademark, the applicant may also receive the right to the trademark. So in copyright, say, for, for um, some drawing, as I said, should be should have this aesthetic function, then if we go back to trademarks, so the trademark should be also descriptive and uh, it should have a good representation of the object. So both trademarks and copyrights can be uh, offered some separate protection. And if we look at the case law, we see that the judges will decide on damages for both. Next, industrial designs versus trademarks. So, and the situation is entirely different. So, both types of objects will receive their protection following an examination. If a third party is involved, then you need to look at the eligibility for registration. For example, whether one asset can be registered if another already exists. So, geographical indications, Article 6 in the legislation that provides for some additional grounds for the refusal of registration of trademark, and these are relative grounds. So that the legislation says that trademarks will not be registered if they have some elements that would copy or replicate industrial designs that are owned by other right holders. Therefore, we see that industrial design can prevail over trademark. So the and it will not be considered as infringement, but the, we can also take a, a, a station or the case where we will have uh, some similarity. So that similarity that will not be considered as infringement, but nevertheless it can be seen as a similar. So industrial results or industrial designs are results of intellectual activity. And again, back to this aesthetic function that also will come into play and will be similar to trademarks. Whenever there is a conflict of reg regulation, so we have a trademark aspiration and industrial design that has been registered, so and the problem arises. So this problem can be resolved through this principle of confusingly similar. As it says, again, Article 6 in our legislation that regulates industrial designs and also that says that trademark will not be registered if it uh, copies it, the industrial design or if it they can be seen as confusingly similar. And again, the right holder that there will be prevailing in that case will be the right holder of the industrial design. An indication or trademark, and I would talk at those indications and we'll look at the patentability criteria so it will not always work. 
for industrial designs or uh, trademarks. And uh, again, if there are multiple parties involved, we may have this situation where the third party will get a, a leg legitimate right, but at the same time, the rights of the parties may be infringed as well. So industrial designs are three-dimensional, dim and trademarks are three-dimensional as well, and they can be implemented on similar devices. Such as, and then, again, the two types will receive separate protection. And in court, the judges will have to decide it on a case-by-case for issues such as compensation or damages. For instance, if we have the infringer that would rely on the, the aesthetic functions to use the IP assets, and it can also come into conflict with the expression of cultural traditions and Article 6 of the legislation also provides for the following, that the registration is not allowed for trademarks are those, for those um, indications that will reproduce without any permission from the author or the competent person some characters from literary works or artworks as well as from those works that are considered to be the national values. And also there are other types of works that are statutory, they are registered and listed. So these are the elements of traditional culture and these elements can be used for trademarks only if statutory conditions are met in terms of folklore protection. So the main idea behind that regulation is that not to distort, not to alter, but to show every respect for the culture of the country. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Imadov. An absolutely stunning speech. Unfortunately, it is the first time I've listened to your lecture, and I must say that our ideas coincide in many aspects, and I think that we can already work as co-authors in many respects. I liked your speech very much. It is a very in-depth analysis, a very informative lecture, full of innovative ideas. I'm simply glad that there are such excellent scholars as your, as you. Uh, it's a special holiday for me today because I've met such an excellent person as, uh, as you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Fedorov. I'm always ready to work by your side. It's a special honor and privilege for me to work with outstanding scholars as you are. Yes, thank you. I would like to give floor to our next speaker, Natal Ms. Natalia Romashova. She is director of the Department of Legal Regulation of Russia. And I have known Natalia ever since she was only Natasha. But even back then, she worked with the Ministry of Culture in the legal department. And I still remember she, we worked very fruitfully together as we were drafting various laws and uh, decrees of the government. So, Ms. Ramashev, you have the floor. Your report is such an aspect of the commercial use of artworks that are part of the Museum Fund of the Russian Federation. A very interesting topic. Yes, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Vlef, for your very good voice. Yes, time flies. You know, we're sitting here and remember these excellent times back then when we were at the, you were at the very uh, origins of the law and copyright. 
And we were those who initiated changes to this law, but we always ask you for your advice. Thank you very much for your past work, and we are very glad to see you, Mr. Vliv, and to hear you as well. Dear participants of the conference, on behalf of the Minister of Cultural Explanation, I would like to welcome all of you. I would like to wish all of you very fruitful work in this conference. And clearly, we also wish you we all wish you all good health. Now, uh, as a representative of the Ministry of Culture, I would like to touch upon the topic of commercial use of images and artworks that are part of the Museum Fund of Russian Federation. Uh, this use is quite widespread right now, because uh, the manufacturer would like to c draw attention to their products or services to increase the value and the sales. But at the same time, we need to understand very clearly that museums, museums play very so important social and cultural functions. One of them is to create the culture and to teach to taste. Using the uh, works of art, of g global art, in m many com commercial or household aspects, can be totally uh, inappropriate. This is why I'd like to focus on a number of issues that we take into account when artworks are used for commercial purposes or as means to individualize a product. One of these aspects is related to various legal regulations of corporate assets on one hand and items of museum funds on the other hand. So this involves various paragraphs of the civil code and the federal law on museum fund and museums of the Russian Federation on the other hand. The existing special regulation underscores the, the dualism of material law and copyright. For instance, the norms of museum law of the Russian Federation limit commercial use uh, or reproduction of items from museum collections and install a special legal regime for such items. Uh, uh, the law provides for a law of, of, for the right of museums to transfer such items for use and uh, for a, a right to issue permits to use printed and other materials bearing images of uh, items from museums and museum collections. And here it is important not only items that are a part of museum collection, but also objects regular ob objects located in the area of museums. So, the museums receive special right to, oh, to, to command uh, over the items on their collection. Despite the, that says that anybody is free, free to use an item which is in public domain, it is always necessary to obtain a permit from the museum for commercial use in accordance with the law on museum funds. Systemic interpretation says that the museum's permit is required whenever a request is filed to use uh, an item from the museum collection to use the image of the building of a museum to reproduce into the interior of a museum, the exterior of a museum, even uh, something which is not a part of the museum property, but which has an individual scientific or arti artistic value. Quite often, when people would like to use something that a museum owns, a question can arise who actually owns a particular item which can be can seen as part of the museum collection. Experts have been working for a long time to fill the museum catalog with information about uh, information about uh, assets ownership of the museum. This government catalog is an information system with open access. Anybody can obtain this information. Furthermore, it bears also images of museum items. The museum community has a special practice with respect to transfer of rights to use the museum as assets. This practice says there are no universal uh, once and for all rules. In each time it's a special project. The museum must contain the right 
uh, whether it is possible to transfer the right in each individual case if the necessity arises. In particular, uh, to give you an example of the ways that can be used, I can see that we could talk about reproduction for any commercial purposes, reproduction for pu public uh, show use in various publications, replication, multimedia, 3D models, etc., etc. A person intended to obtain a right to use a museum asset files a brief description of the purposes of the reflection and the uh, way it should be used and the product which should bear the image. Based on this information, the management of the museum decides whether it is possible to provide such a right. Often, agreements concluded by, agreements, uh, by museums are of combined nature which provides not only transfer of rights to use the item, but also the museum can select the item and can organize the photographic sessions. This gives the museum reasonable extent of control over the way these items are used. This minimizes the reputational risk of museums, limits the distribution of unreliable information, which can, which can uh, confuse the user. Thus, when commercial, uh, when items that are part of the museum funds are used in a commercial way, it is required, first of all, to obtain the permit from the author or the, the author's legal successors and to obtain a permission from the museum. It is also important that, unless otherwise proven otherwise, photographic copies of museum items are also individual corporate assets. A, a photographer has a copyright to such a photograph irrespective of the artistic value of such an artistic uh, asset. A photographer can select exposition and various uh, other aspects of a photographic, uh, so photographic session. The, therefore, uh, the copyright of the photographer should not be violated either. The second aspect I would like to focus on, use of images of artworks, this is related to their registration as trademarks. According to Article 483 of Civil Code, it is not possible to re register cultural values which are part of the museum collections if this registration should be in the name of somebody who is not the owner of such a museum asset. So, to be able to register uh, something which is similar to the image, uh, the trademark, the museum, the museum is also expected to obtain its permission, to give us permission. Mm. Same applies to official names uh, or images of items of national heritage, but also items of global or cultural heritage. It should be pointed out that in accordance with the civil code, it is also illegal to register to M marks which bear ele elements which are counterproductive or are against the uh, s morals of the society. This is intended to protect the moral rights of the user of, uh, of a product. In particular, we're talking here about works which are widely known, which are part of the global heritage. In case a museum item, uh, an item in the museum collection uh, is registered, but this will be the interest of the society, then this registration will not be, will not take place. And here I would like to give you an, a number of excellent examples of the work of Ross Patton. For instance, the registration was refused with respect to the trademark of the Council of Swan Lake, because as we all know, the Swan Lake is the name of the globally known opera by Pyotr Tchaikovsky. And an application was filed to register an American, a US-based company that distilled alcoholic beverages. So it was decided that 
this was against the public interest of the Russian Federation. Furthermore, an applicant wanted to register the Alexandrovsky garden as a trademark. Oh, oh, oh. Or uh, other various various acts of, of economic exclusion were also protected. The Ross Patent decided, decided to refuse registration of this trademark because the Alexandrovsky part is part of the Moscow Kremlin, which is part of the special cultural heritage of the Russian Federation. It has the memorial of the war fame and the grave of the unknown soldier. This is why uh, providing a monopoly right to, uh, to private organization to use this trademark would, the, would give the user, on one hand, unsubstantiated right, and on the other hand, registering the trademark Alexander of Siskat with respect to all the above services could damage the reputation of this item, of this asset of cultural heritage. So, so this is in accordance with the Russian law and commercial use of artworks, which is part of the commercial fund. Uh, this is what I wanted to touch upon in my report today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Mr. Ramosha. A very informative report. Thank you. I would not, wouldn't like to comment on this. You know, I don't comment because I don't want to make our sessions longer. I encourage all the speakers to, to observe the regulations, not more than 15 minutes. So 15 minutes are just 15 minutes. This applies to me as well. Unfortunately, uh, that I not, uh, I'm not always capable to uh, observe this still. So, next speaker is Marina Roshkova, Chief Scientific Officer, Institute of Legislation and Comparative Law. Your report is copyright in algorithmic society. You have the floor. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, Mr. Fedotov, Mr. Evlev, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. You know, I'm very glad to participate in this uh, very strong scientific conference. My report will focus on the development of Corporate Institute. You know, uh, uh, I think this name is a bit strange, but I chose it for a reason, because I'd like to draw your attention to the following. Quite often we see in publications and we hear in speeches that we're, we're living in an information society. But people keep saying more and more that we are already in an algorithmic society. And I think we need to think whether this uh, has any value and any meaning for for the copyright, the fact that, that we live in the environment of algorithms. I think that it has a special meaning. And before I start discussing legal issues in particular, I would like to clarify this a bit and to identify what an algorithm is and how it can coincide with AI or robots. Because these concepts are strongly interrelated and quite often they shouldn't even, even be divided. We should be talking of algorithm alone. You know, I would like to rely upon the uh, report of the Council of Europe algorithm human rights, which was made back, back in 2017. Algorithm, uh, the concept of algorithm should be determined in different ways for different areas. It will have one definition for IT, it will have the, another meaning for mathematics, it will have a third definition for the social spheres. So today I would like to discuss the meaning of algorithm as an asset in the IT sphere. And if we simplify, I think that we can say that the algorithm is a combination of IT operations that are carried out in accordance with the strict rules, and as a result, they help to solve existing tasks or to achieve a certain result. So this is the idea of an algorithm. Talking of AI, since it is an information system, it includes at least three blocks, three main blocks. First, it's a database, 
or a set of big data, an array of big data. Two, it's a, a, a computer, a program that helps uh, to solve a task using special algorithms and an intellectual interface. And this is the combination of means and methods that helps a person to talk to the information system, to the AI. And again, if we simplify strongly, we can say that AI is an intellectual information system which uses special algorithms algorithms and re relying on the existing database helps to solve questions asked by humans, including those questions that, to, in our opinion, are part of the creative area. And here, I would like to say that AI, among other things, can learn itself as it solves the existing tasks. And this can be seen, for instance, when it processes tens of thousands of various artworks, and it can create using special algorithms, quite unusual works, unusual assets of creative work, if, uh, which, if they were created by a human, would be definitely recognized as a, a piece of musical work, a piece of artistic work. Here we would like to touch upon the, the difference or maybe similarity uh, between AI and a robot. So AI is a complicated intellectual and information system. So it is uh, it, it hosted in a computer, but as soon as it gets a special physical form, we start talking of a, of a robot. So if AI in the computer is simply AI as it is, but if it is uh, given a physical form, then we're talking about a cyber-physical system. So intellectual robots, robots of the third generation, are desired not only to do certain physical functions, but also to solve intellectual tasks. And they have a form which meets their functions. So we shouldn't expect that a, a smart robot is always an android as Sophia, the well-known robot. No, intellectual robots, smart robots, are also household robots, or combat robots, or drones, un unmanned aerial vehicles. They're also robots, intellectual robots. But exoskeletons are also smart robots. So we can see here that there are lots of various types of robots. And as I said, the material form depends on their function. And again, if we're talking about an uh, artistic robot, an, a robot artist, that it can be just a hand uh, with an arm that would draw pictures. Now, going over to the problems which we're facing now, which should definitely be analyzed, I would like to say that they can be divided into uh, items uh, created by technologies. These items fall into groups. On the one hand, it's items created by humans using special digital algorithms and technologies, and items created by AI, on the other hand. There's a difference between them. And the problems which arise here with respect to the legal legal issues also differ. Now, if we talk about assets created by humans using special technologies of today, in this aspect, we're talking about algorithms which are used in the IT, and these algorithms help solving creative tasks, among other things. Now, just an example is a, a photograph which we have discussed today. And talking about personal cameras, we know that these cameras are capable of setting up the camera itself without human interference. And it will be using algorithms to adjust, to correct the photograph it has just made. For instance, if you look at applications on your smartphones, then such photographs can also be made and processed, and as a result, we will see a practically a new photograph. And this can be achieved by uh, 
but the user can achieve it by just tapping the finger on the smartphone's screen. You need just to tell the smartphone what should be changed. We can see this in selfies when you can enlarge your eyes, when can you make your wrinkles smoother, and we see a fair fairy instead of a young girl. The intellectual property that is uh, produced by a person, I mean, goes um, above, like tapping uh, buttons on devices, and uh, probably it, it can be relied on algorithm because photographic products are designed by, uh, by algorithm, while persons have this very mechanic fun function. So is there any ground to call it just a product or an asset that comes as a product of um, human creativity. Well, I don't think that it is entirely correct, but um, on the flip side, so many authors that are fond of photographs, they can use Photoshop and similar applications and to improve on the images so they can add details, they can change colors, or they can bring several elements into one picture, and this will lead to the emergence of unique products, and that, that this is going to be a unique creation that can be classified as a result of intellectual or creative activity. So there is no this uh, one suits all approach for this uh, category of products, and these are the algorithm. I think they should be taken into consideration because this is a dual sword, because they can either promote creativity or demote it. And that this is the problem that is, has been very conflicting today, and if we want to address it, I think we need to uh, look at the publications and also this is the principle of originality that can be used to establish protection. So the existing legislation of the Russian Federation sets forth two criteria that this needs to come as a result of um, creative work, the 1257 and the 1259 article that says that it should come as a very specific shape so that there is, should be the result of a creativity, but the objective shape is one and a single criteria that has been provided for by the legislation. So as a result, so we see that all the products actually can receive protection under the legislation. Even the, those products that are not very available in terms of their originality, and therefore this approach can be contrasted with the European approaches. In France, for example, there is no criteria of originality in the legislation, but however, in both in the doctrine and the case law, they have this approach, while in German law you would have the doctrine of this threshold criteria in order to provide uh, protection to IP assets because the creativity level will be assessed in terms of both its original and also its individual nature and also so the representation of author's character or properties. Even if this uh, uh, original criteria is uh, provided for in the legislation, if it is directly stipulated, then it implies protection for the IP asset photographs. As mentioned already, there is the directive for the protection of the copyright and related right of 1996 that says explicitly that the criteria of originality should be taken into consideration. So the, this very criteria, in fact, probably does not require any formalization with legislation, but at the same time, 
needs to be employed with practice and it's high time to make a better use of it because it will provide better protection uh, for those assets or products that are created by people with the use of algorithms and software applications. So this is high time to address this issue in particular. And the AR and those assets and products that can be created without any involvement of humans or persons, I think, can be seen as another important question to be addressed. So the, all the objects that are created by AI so are deemed to have both commercial and economic value, and I wouldn't take argument with that statement, because it was in 20, I think, 19, that there was a, a portrait of Edmund Tembele, and that was solved for half a million dollars. So the, the bottom line is that these kind of products are in demand, and there are people willing to buy. So AI produced assets also require some amendments to IP legislation in order to have this kind of uh, objects protected in it. So we need to also take a very critical view towards these propositions, though they shouldn't be overlooked when we want to and start amending IP legislation. So because the current prerequisite that or the current presumption is it's the human being that it can be uh, considered to be an author. So AI cannot be considered as an author of IP assets or objects, and uh, there is no need to change its legislation in respect of intangible assets. But uh, on the contrary, the pecuniary rights and the international practice has already demonstrated several solutions, several alternatives solution. So AI is not considered to be an independent economic operator. So therefore, those bonuses or enumeration can be received by a very limited number of persons that need to be identified by the national agency. So AI and the rights can be attributed to the developers of AI program for one, and uh, these rights can be also attributed to the career, uh, such as a, a robot painting pictures, so the owner of the robot will be considered to be the owner or the, hold, the right holder vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the object that has been created. That's database and algorithm, also inquiries that have been forwarded for creative tasks. So this can be also seen as another category of authors. And there is the fourth category that is in legal terms, is not that favorable that when we have these objects transferred into the public domain. So these are clearly four specific ways to choose from for the lawmaker. So if they want to provide some statutory protection to this kind of IP rights. Marina Alexandrovna? So this uh, just would like to remind you that your time is up. I just have a couple of sentences to conclude in a couple of minutes. So there is one subtlety that needs to be taken into account for AI. I mean, there is no author in, from a formal perspective, while from the perspective of legal protection, that's the copyright that helps us to protect the rights of the author. So when we addressing AI produced objects, and uh, I don't think that we need to amend copyright legislation, I would rather think of creating a separate legal structure rather than changing and amending the existing one for copyrights. And that, that will be my concluding remarks, and thank you.
so much for listening. Thank you very much. Your presentation has been very exciting indeed, and I'm just fascinated by the presentations that we hear today. But I would like to give the floor to Professor Yakov Schreiberg, academic advisor and um, Russian National Public Library for Science and Technology. And you can announce the topic of your presentation yourself. And I would like to welcome all the organizers, the moderators, and all their colleagues. And um, I first uh, prepared my presentation. It's a lengthy material, and I think I will be able to be brief. And, uh, I will skip some of the slides to stick to the gist of it. So, I represent the library, the library and the library system as a whole, because um, copyright problematic. Problem of Поскольку в цифровую эпоху very important to the library so uh, in digital environment we see that new opportunities have been opened up and that access has been provided at the same time copyright needs to be preserved even in the library environment and we are well aware of the importance of this aspect so copyright is a complex aspect and obviously going through Time, there are the different positions and the different stakeholders, the publishers, the cinema politicians, and libraries. These are all the stakeholders of the system of the copyright transformation. So today, we attach this key importance to balancing the public interests and the rights of authors and right holders. Intellectual property deals with private rights, and they may either be beneficial to the public or they will not be beneficial to the public. And the the very interesting to feature is that copyright is very advanced, but it doesn't satisfy to the full extent these two topics in political and economic discourse. So these are the topics so as for digital technology. Copyright prevents the progress of innovation because of cumbersome systems in this very free world. And secondly, and this uh, relates to consumer that copyright prevents people from learning, from sharing, and collaborating under the digital framework. So the legacy legislation for copyright is not adequate and appropriate to the condition. Therefore, many governments, countries, and right holders, public organizations, and libraries engaged in the review and revision of current provisions. So the authors that provide reviews for books and monographs will take exactly the same amount of time that copyright will extend for the life of the North plus 70 years. This is a very long period of time and probably there will be different consequences for different kind of um, work. So if we look at novels, so novels will be relevant for a longer period of time as compared to scientific and research papers. And therefore, we need to be able to provide access to the viewers, to the, to all the novelties. So to do so, we need to either shorten the period or to stipulate some conditions of the use. And this leads us to the public domain because when articles are published, in the public domain, then they can be easily traced, and they can be easily accessed, especially by those subscribers, for instance, that have no, they don't have much money to pay for higher subscription fees. Next, the public interest can be also taken into consideration whenever legislation 
review is underway and uh, limitations or some exceptions can be introduced to extend the right of disabled persons and to implement the principles of fair use and fair dealing. So there is this narrow angle of interpretation of the public interest that is um, the access that has been provided by library and it is a 100 percent benefit to the public. At the same time, we need to make sure that a very effective model is in place that provides for enumeration as well. So in general, and when we are looking at the transformation of copyright, it's free or to remain neutral. Because all the stakeholders and the parties concerned, they have their right to, to take a stand and uh, Unfortunately, we haven't struck the balance yet, as yet, in these conditions. So, if we look globally, and globally and nationally, so there are different efforts that have been undertaken to improve the current legislation. So digital Millennium Copyright Act in the United States that was adopted in the late 90s. And so this legislation has played a major role in the development of both European legislation and domestic one. Uh, however, the government of the United States have introduced uh, three amendments, so, and uh, there's uh, provider protection to providers of online services in certain instances where users will be breaching copyright, including the setting up of a system of notification notice and take down system that enables right holders uh, to provide information, notify providers uh, about the material that uh, infringes on their right, and then secondly, the uh, ensuring legal protection against unauthorized access to the objects or works and liability that can be imposed for providing false information on copyright. It was on the 21st of March 2020, the Copyright Office in the United States produced a full comprehensive report on this um, the operation of copyright in the digital area, so, and it covers the 10 years of case institute of papers. So, but, and again, no balance has been achieved as yet. However, the Copyright Office has reached the conclusion that uh, the legislation uh, produces some benefits for technological company, and then it's been acknowledged that providers are not capable of tracing all the materials and publications that are placed online in terms of potential infringements. And the, they have plans to start a new website that is copyright.gov, and one of the senator also wants to draft changes for copyright in digital era. So as for fair use, so this fair use doctrine also enables us to treat many acts as legal, how many it's very difficult to pinpoint specific factors, and we have seen lots of cases that have been brought before U.S. courts, and the, the most recent example that was uh, fair use Google project that was in April 2016. It was the unanimous decision of the appellate court in the United States that um, dealt with the case and was the scanning of documents from libraries, and it was considered to be legitimate that put an end to this uh, litigation, even at the battle, a battle that was started 10 years ago. So I, I remember it very well because we trace it from the very beginning. And the, so now it's over and the court decision has been delivered. Now we have this contemporary trend that's a fair use for consumers and the fair use is turned into free use, like fair 
that it calls free, but if it's free for you, for customers, then will be fair for the author. Another interesting case from the UK. There are the following laws in the area of copyright. Uh, uh, basic law from 1988, uh, copyright designs and paid patents. The copyright rights in databases in regulation 1997 and the copyright related rights regulations from 2003. And in the UK, similar to many other countries of uh, Europe, there's the fair dealings concept, which is similar to fair use, but not equal. I'm not going to delve in it for a long time, but there will be very interesting analysis which is going to be published in the very near future about the differences and similarities between these two concepts. Back in 2014, five most important legal tools were introduced on exceptions from copyright. You can see them on the list. It's the making of digital copies, the, the fair dealing principle, which applies to non-commercial and private research. It was allowed to digitalize analog collections of libraries, provided that the product would be available from computer terminals in the libraries. And the British Library, for instance, was given a right for its readers to, to use the limitations and exceptions from copyright uh, in the UK, irrespective of the contracts with, uh, with the publishers or vendors. As a result, the UK, in response to the proposals on the copyright reform, adopted an innovative solution on orphan uh, works. This new licensing scheme allowed users to uh, ask for a non-exclusive license for use of an, of an orphan work, both for in commercial and non-commercial purposes. And the course of the EU directive on orphan works if a fair, if the rights holder carries out a fair search, it is it can be published again for non-commercial purposes. Another exception introduced in the UK. It is as follows. It was allowed entities to digitalize written audiovisual and works and to present them on their websites for non-commercial use. And the British Library was given this opportunity. And today it is entitled to publish on its website various orphan works for five years. Europe, and I will just give you this slide, has the following regulations. It's the directive of the European Parliament of March, May the 22nd, 2001. Then the Directive of the European Parliament uh, of, of 2008, and last but not least, the Directive of the European Digital Market, which is a revised directive on copyright, which al was already outdated from the time it was adopted in 2001. And one of the main purposes is to modernize the existing regulatory framework with account for existing and developing digitalization and to protect authors and inventors for the purposes of the welfare of the European culture. In Russia, the laws are based on the Constitution as well, and part four of the Civil Code. And the Russian legislation has the following limitations and restrictions in the area of copyright. They are reflected in Articles 12, 1273, 1274, and 1275. Russia, for instance, has introduced a special uh, regulatory uh, uh, per permission to create single digital copies for scientific and educational purposes, provided that they, uh, such works have not been published in the past 10 years. At the moment, we see appeals to provide access to knowledge which conflict with copyright. And this continues to happen due to various different positions of authors and public publishers on one hand, 
and due to the difficulties of taking into account all the circumstances in each case. This is why we need to continue raising awareness and educating people in this area. There are three main reasons why these reasons why these issues have to be dealt with. We need to continue the documentation and transfer of information about rights. We need to establish the authenticity uh, of uh, the author. And we should also bear in mind that the issues of copyright quite often are central to the the uh, issue of protection and access to materials. Another important aspect is open licenses, C Creative Commons licenses, which in our view are practically ignored uh, in the current practices. And the, this, creative, this Creative Commons issue is one of the ways to legalize transfer to open access. And open access is about science, it's about our future, and this will definitely take into account all the problems in the present-day transforming world of the digital right. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Schreiber, Schenk, thank you very much. A very, very interesting report, a very informative report. And you have been able to fit into into these 15 minutes, which is also outstanding. Now I would like to give forward to Mr. Eugen Aryevich, Senior Counsel of Baker Mackenzie CIS. He is Doctor of Legal Sciences, and he has to go, he's going to make a report. Thank you. Thank you. I will share my screen. Right. Today I would like to discuss the following topic. Gray areas at the intersection of copyright, industrial design, and trademarks. No, so this is the forward. Uh, so so the forward, one fool can ask so many questions that 100 wise men would not be able to answer them. So. In my presentation, I would like to combine the rows. I will ask a question, and I will try answering it. So the Institute of Copyright, Industrial Designs, and Trademark Institutes are very well-known institutes, both the pr practitioners and theoreticians in this area. And it may seem that people have worked a, 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 lot, a lot on it, but it seems to me that at the intersection of this institute there's a whole lot of grey areas which are still waiting for their researchers and for regulations, both in the area of a regulatory framework and in the area of law enforcement. I'm not trying to offer any ready answers. I'd like rather to focus on one grey area. And I hope that the issues I'm going to raise will be reflected or maybe even answered in the following speeches in this event. But also, you may find it fruitful for your further legislative work. Right. Clearly, since we're discussing a collision, the, the most uh, natural question would be who, do, who would win at the end? If we look at this old ch ch childish joke, who would win, a, a whale or an elephant, if they start a fight? Well, in real nature, they would rarely meet. Mr. Aryevich, I, I apologize. You're trying to share a presentation. We cannot see it. You can't? J just a second. We can ask our technicians to share your screen, finally. Any better? Not yet. Yes. You, you got final. Yes, 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 please continue. We can see your presentation now. Right. 
Вот мы видим сейчас пока второй слайд. Yes, we can see slide number two now. So there's, there's this collision, a full asking question that a professor cannot answer. So I would like to show slide number three now. Yes, we can see your slide. So in our case, there is also this intellectual activities, in particular artistic works, scientific works, and the social desires, and, or of, and means in individual individualization, such as trademark, can can quite occur in commercial operations. But, but they sometimes come into conflict. I can remember an interesting legal case where two well-known producers of alcoholic beverages had a conflict about a corporate label. One of them w wanted uh, to stop the infringement of the copyright, and the other one wanted to stop the infringement of the trademark. So did one of them had, have priority over the other one? What would be the criteria? C clearly, it would be natural to look uh, at the origin. That is, in this case, we need to look into, into the civil code to get the answer. As regards individualization, the answer can be it's up part six of Article 1655 of the Civil Code of the Russian Federation. If there is means of individualization or trademarks and other marks are similar and this similarity can confuse the consumer or the counterpart, then the individualization mean uh, that the one that came through the first existence has a priority or the one that has a, the earlier priority. Back in 2014, another norm was added to this particular paragraph, and it applied to industrial designs. If the means of individualization of a natural design is similar, uh, and this similarity can confuse the consumer, then read the text. The principles were clear and logical. For, First come, first served. Yes, slide 15, 12. Uh, next slide, paragraph 6, article 1252. So the principle is quite simple, uh, quite logical. First come, first served. And the first come principle. The, w the way it is used in the Russian Federation with respect to in registration of means of individualization means that the, the first who made the first steps to be registered. This creates exclusive rights. In other words, this means that filing an application to register uh, industrial design. This is important because in other countries this would mean that the, the, this would be the first who started to use this. Why is this principle not applied or not included in clear forums? And this question arises with the cases of similarity. With respect to works of art or science, these results of intellectual operation, intellectual activities, alongside with industrial design, and their material manifestation can come into conflict with trademark, for instance. Article 1484. The paragraph 9 of Article 1484 of Civil Code 
says the following. Signs which would be similar, similar to, uh, uh, to the name of a uh, trademark already known in the Russian Federation. Cannot be registered as uh, trademarks. So experts believe that in this way the law protects the, this older corporate asset from infringement by third parties. I don't think this, this is correct. This norm rather should regulate various individual cases, but with respect to works of literature or science, this, should, this applies to characters or the names, and this protection gets even narrower when, when these works are well known in the Russian Federation. But the law does not draw any dependence between protection and the uh, popularity of particular work about. This norm is desired to regulate situations in case of collisions with trademark. But this does not regulate the conflict in the commercial use. Now the question arises. Why does a norm which applies to various assets, such as individualization means or results of intellectual activities, is not included in the common part of the civil code of the Russian Federation? We think that to make it more clear in case of collisions, we first need to understand when copyright starts to occur. The civil code has Article 2030. It, it sets uh, the, uh, the validity of exclusive rights. Exclusive rights to the results of intellectual activities and to uh, and all to the rest of the results of intellectual activity and means of digitalization are set by the present code. So, we can find a special norm in the code that the, the name of the author would be protected forever. Our exclusive right to the but to the work is valid throughout the life of the author. But we cannot find when does the copyright occur, when does it start to apply. The Russian Federation law on copyright and neighboring rights had this norm. It, there was an article, Article 9, the occurrence of copyright and the presumption of authorship. Or copyright to a work of science, literature or art occurs when it is made. For copyright to uh, exist uh, and to be implemented, this work does not have to be registered. This norm does not have direct reference to the moment it, uh, it is created. Still, we can infer that the copyright starts to exist when the work is made. Clearly, it can make a lot a long time to create it. And unlike a concrete date when a particular application is filed to register, in this case the state is notional. But still, this even indirect reference, as the law on copyright had, is better than none, no reference at all. If the law makes it clearer when the copyright starts to exist, then we could extend the application of paragraph 6, article 12, phase 2 of the civil code, and give it the following wording. Well, this article 12, and the two first paragraphs will remain. What we suggest is to add new wording to para 6 in Article 1252 in order to regulate conflicts of law in terms of the means of individualization of artworks or literary works on the one hand and also regulating conflict of laws 
in in relation to industrial designs and versus literary artworks. On the other hand, and this there will be a general principle of priority of the right that came to existence first. So, 1484 article that regulates literary and artistic work does not regulate the situations where trademarks are identical or confusingly similar, not to the name or an abstract, but to the entire work. And we all know that this kind of work can be can come in the form of a slogan, for instance, but this wording also provide a framework to resolve this kind of conflict regulation or norms. So, and again, even if we have this general norm, obviously some specific norms will be redundant. So the 1259 again, and we have the exclusive right to trade name, trade indications on the next slide. So that's 1539. So we're looking at 1539. And that's a inclusive price. So then the, the wording. So if we take a closer look at the wording, then we see that it just copy cut from 1252, and it doesn't add anything substantially. So, to my mind, so the proposition that I put forward in my presentation will help us solve these general problems concerning conflicts of law in respect of results of intellectual activity and certain tools and means of individualization. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being for your timing for being so precise and concise and on this i would like to pass the floor to mr colin representing the the center computer science control and he's to the topic of his presentation current copyright and ip issues relating to science and technology in russia so can you see my presentation not yet. So, distinguished delegates, uh, distinguished Mr. Ingrid, distinguished Mr. Fedotov, so I would like to first express my gratitude for the invitation to take part in this conference. And I would like to highlight the importance of copyright and intellectual property as regards science and technology in Russia and abroad. So the topic of my presentation relies on two the prerequisites. So first, I've been working in this field for more than 60 years, and part of the time was dedicated to the military uh, infrastructure system, and I was responsible for the control systems for both military purposes and the economic purposes. And uh, these past 30 years that I'm a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Center for IT Problematics, that is part of the Federal Center for IT Research and Control with the Russian Academy of Science. We have more than 1,000 specialists in our team and 35 members of the Academy. So we look at the science and technology, and I know this topic inside out. So, and I'm very pleased that my presentation will follow the report by Mr. Schreiber, who held it great respect, because he raised that problem, and I would like to dwell on that. 
In current times, we look at the situation in science and technology, and obviously those relevant problems become high priority in terms of economic development and ensuring both national and global security. And 200 years ago, when Napoleon's troops retreated from Moscow along Smolensk Highway, so he was there surrounded by his national troops, and then he made an order that all these scientists and Duncans should be, should be put in the middle. You can explain that he was, when he was living in Russia, territory, just uh, half of his men died, and the, the idea was that some, uh, war, some people could uh, attack them, so they wanted to preserve those animals, donkeys, because donkeys were carrying their food, and then the scientists, uh, academics, had, were very valuable, because if they were killed, then there wouldn't have been any future for, for the country. So that Nap Napoleon was uh, well aware of the importance of academia and scientists, so that their rank was second. Even there were officers, and it was the public. Technological university that he set up. So, those graduates from the technological university they received the status of officers, so the officers because, army officers, because it was very high and prestigious status in society. And he was very supportive of the science. So, now, 200 years from then, and we see that it's French uh, maths. Science is still in high respect and very prominent in global science. So, and uh, I believe now we need to take it as a slogan that all scientists should be put in the middle and like, surrounded and protected. And I can explain to you why. So it was in the 17th century that the Rome Club published their report on the problems facing humanity in the 20th century. And that report included certain uh, uh, components or certain statements, uh, like uh, the Earth was was already overpopulated and we had to find a solution, then there was an urgent need to form a new intellectual elite, and thirdly, that wasn't that sufficient because we needed more, and we needed to start a new generation, a new era of enlightenment, because at that time generation was not ready to perceive all the benefits of technological advances that can pave the way for the future. So first, there are contemporary criteria for the evaluation or assessment of scientific work so in, in Russia, and a number of other countries have embarked on the path of commercial, commercializing fundamental science and uh, my colleagues and I share that view that it is dangerous. Um, fundamental science uh, will provide um, forecasts, will provide analytics, and also will ensure the scientific prosperity of society as a whole. So if we want to ensure that these functions are in place, we need to award a specific title to our scientists. And, um, in this respect, if we look at the scientific evaluation, or meaning the evaluation of performance of our scientists, then one of the criteria would be a number of publications and then a number of indices, so indices that will be included in the web. web uh, science focus, and then Hirsch index will be used as a benchmark or as a reference point. I would like to explain more about this organization. So they are also the results of evaluation. So this uh, evaluation of performance appraisal tool can be applied to specific scientists because uh, it will affect their 
rate of remuneration. So and also the factor will take into consideration their publications, their participation, plus it can be used as a precondition for receiving grants and subsidies. It can also be used as a performance criteria in terms of performances and implementation of even public projects or some international grants. Next, when we look at strategic research and the funds are allocated, there is a specific condition to be met, that is the two to be published in the two worldwide databases. Next, the consulting Thomas Reuters Corporation from the U.S. So we are trying to set the right slide on the screen. So we can go to slide two, and now we are going to show slide five. So Thomas Reuter, that's a major consulting corporation from the U.S., and they have this web of science. We're not very clear about the, the expert pool, and then it is also has this condition of paid access plus discrimination. That means the selection of publications and those scientists that are more discriminated are the scientists from Russia and China, and plus there is a so-called black market that is operated by intermediaries for authors from Russia, and um, their fee would range between 500 and 5,000 dollars, and that is the, the kind of level of pay that is uh, given to scientists in Russia. So we look at intellectual property and the results that are free the country, that's a, like a brain drain, and now we need to pay for it. So secondly, these databases are not accessible by Russian scientists because they cannot pay for it, and then the ratings that are there are not adequate, and as a result, that reduces the efficiency of scientific work. So I'll give you an example. I have 500 publications in my online library. That's the uh, Russian system of citations. And that um, includes 9,000, 9,000 uh, references. And then index, uh, the first indices would be the certain level. So that means that uh, from year to year, I produce 25 publications. Meaning every two weeks, I publish either an article or a monograph or a scientific report for the conference. However, so I do not apply for those scientific grants because, as a precondition, I will have to give the number of publications with these specific databases over the past five years. So, can you see this whole picture? I believe that this situation is very serious, and uh, this problem is not typical of Russia only, but um, there is a kind of confrontation um, in respect of Russia and China probably. Um, from the West. So, given that kind of confrontation, I think Russia needs to build up its own rating system. Uh, and uh, we have every possibility to do so. We could start setting up a scientific center and bringing together of prominent analytical scientific institutions, so we could also involve the Institute for Public Science, and we have so another Institute for People's Industry, so that would take the three 
institutes and will put them into one center that will be supported by the Russian Academy of Science. And this will give us just an excellent system for performance evaluation, for the ratings that can be offered to Russian scientists. And will provide sound rates and marks. But as for financing, I believe that this endeavor should be financed both by the government and scientists themselves, and the data bases will need to have free access so that is really important to scientists. The next problem that I would like to raise would be in respect of security, both national and international. We see there is sort of mismatch between the levels of cultural development and technological one. And obviously, the future is coming on to us at a very fast pace. People are ill-prepared, they are morally are not ready, they are professionally are not ready, and even their worldview is not that wide enough to uh, encompass all the changes, and that was the problem that highlighted by the Rome Club, so the world view of the intellectuals, it will be forward-looking attitude that can be combined with a new, new enlightenment, and this will take every effort to promote free access to publications and also need to give incentives to the authors or by raising their tiers, probably publishing new journals such as Open Access Journal that covers about 30 editions in Europe. In addition to that, we need to have um, the society, society of Knowledge publications on a wider scale, plus we need to help with broadcasting prominent Russian scientists' reports and presentations on national ecological and biological security. So, and the opportunities or possibilities are there. And, uh, I would like to continue with the, the subject of expertise uh, and, or examination, the subject of examination, that will be the expert examination for all networks of intellectual activity in Russia for more than 20 years. So we have um, these tools for measuring the social efficiency of new technologies. There is a multitude of such tools, and their importance varies. If we take a specialist in IP field, then probably it can be somehow challenging to come up with this uh, importance factors and factor, probably several uh, things can be taken into account, but the uh, so you're just, uh, you know, mentioned the economy of social, the economics of social time, but I, I unfortunately, so there are, you're 15 minutes or over, but, right, but I would like to conclude. So that's universal criteria, like we need to save the social time so that supermarket goes. So this can be multiplied by millions of people and you know, the other you'll get the right model of management or administration. And uh, my view is we need to factor in social efficiency into technological development. And uh, my three statements to conclude would be the current situation, the field of science and technology in Russia represents a threat to its sovereignty and national security, and this needs to be addressed. So it is very important to build up a national rating system in Russia that then will be rolled out across Eurasian countries, and it is also vitally important to revive the system of scientific enlightenment in Russian society. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. You have touched upon a very important problem.
this problem can be pain points of our science and the scientific community. I think what you were discussing is quite topical for many of us. But like many other problems, it has various aspects to it. So we need to discuss these problems, definitely, and we need to look for solutions to these problems. Thank you, Mr. Colin. Now, colleagues, we can make our shorter and we can give floor to other speakers, but we still have the two speakers. Are there more speakers? Mr. Blizness has told me that he would not be able to speak today, unfortunately. But we have also Mr. Moskvich. Are you here? Yes, we'll give you the floor, definitely. And then Mr. Zaborovsky. Mr. Zaborovsky, it's for you to decide. Either you be the first in session one, or you'll be number three in, in, the, second pl uh, in the second plenary meeting. Your microphone, please. У меня сейчас просто идет лекция для студентов, и я как раз пообещал им, что я выступлю именно сейчас. I'm giving a lecture to my students right now. I promised to my students that I would be speaking to them as well. This is a this is a part of our educational program. So, with their permission, I would participate in this particular meeting. Yes, but it'll it'll be over in 15 minutes. That's the problem. What what в чем проблема? So what can we do then? Because my lecture will begin, I will not be able to attend. I can make it in five minutes, if you like. The main idea I have to share... Oh, yes, yes, sorry for interrupting you. Yes, I would like to ask Mr. Mos Mr. Moskvich to, to make his presentation a bit brief, more brief as well. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, my presentation, please. Hello, everybody. I'll be touching upon a new set of problems. Uh, there was this federal uh, area established uh, not far from the city of Sochi, beside the Olympic Park. And this federal area has a special status. There's a special law on federal areas which makes uh, this law uh, uh, an entity with a special strategic value. And uh, the purpose is to uh, ensure stable social and economic development of the area. But the main thing this means is that uh, this is not an entity of the Russian Federation, but, but uh, it is similar to an entity of the Russian Federation. Furthermore, it is a special area which, uh, which uh, carries out the authorities of a regional entity, but also some of the authorities of the federal level entity, in case it is delegated such authorities. So it is a special area which can draft its own laws both at the municipal, at the regional, regional and at the federal levels. And this is why a question arises with respect to it, which, which applies to the name of Sirius. Furthermore, this special area has another area which will be integrated into the federal area. It's the EMTC. This EMTC is an innovative scientific and technical center. The main purpose of this center is to engage into scientific research. On the one hand, this implies a very interesting taxation regime. On the other hand, it grows and it also has other privileges specified. So, these two areas use the word serious in their heading. We all know what serious is. This the uh, word, uh, the name of the star is used in various languages. So the question arises, can this word be protected in one way or another? Because there are various 
ways of using this particular word in Russia, the Russian Federation. There's a law on the word St. Petersburg, for instance. There's, there's the term of Tatarstan. So this issue with respect to Sirius was also raised. So this uh, area was established as well. Uh, many entities were created that have the name Sirius in their heading. Furthermore, many requests to register this uh, word Sirius were filed to register it, uh, both in Latin and the Cyrillic alphabet. So the question arises, can we do something about it? Can we protect it? Do we need to protect it? And the reason for this initiative, the source of this initiative to protect the word Sirius is explained by the following. People would like to differentiate between this name and the activities which would not be part of the federal area's activities. What does this federal territory do? This federal area will be mainly engaged in educational activities and in scientific research activities. But the nuance is, is that since the residents of this area have right to vote for their laws and to adopt their laws, they can forbid, they can ban using an, a particular trademark or a sign which is used elsewhere in Russia. They have lots of various authorities and we've been trying to determine the, these authorities in the best possible way so that we do not infringe other rights of residents which uh, who live in other areas in the Russian Federation. So that they can, or so that the, this can be used legally elsewhere. So we have offered the following solution: we register lots of various trademarks, but that contain the name of Sirius in various areas. That's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing that we did: we wanted to register a Sirius logo as a well-known logo in the Russian Federation. And the third, the most controversial one is to amend the laws of this federal area and to authorize the administration to issue permits to use the name and images of cities in the federal area. The area of this entity is not big, but it is quite good from the commercial point of view. And lots of companies would like to establish their rep offices there. There's another nuance to this. There are three signs already that have been registered by the Talents uh, and Success Foundation. And this foundation initiated the project for the Research and Innovation Center. And it is not a part of the federal area, but it has it is related to the management of this area because it manages this, the innovative center and the center is involved in the management of the area, so there's a lot of overlapping with respect to authorities. So when the question arose, who should be filing the application to register the trademark, the answer was it should be the foundation. But what relations does the foundation has have to this federal area? Now, that's the question. Or why should the foundation, well, the, the, it's like this, the foundation uh, is engaged in educational areas. It has lots of regional centers throughout Russia. Furthermore, it established a special entity for talented children, which was a which was recognized the world's best education practices by the Nature magazine. Furthermore, there are lots of other examples and real models and where Sirius have been helping children to develop. Furthermore, this area has a university and there will be other organizations that will be related both to the Innovative Center and to the federal area. Now, talking about changes in the laws, we have some ideas that we would like to implement. These ideas were initially raised 
among other things, uh, in our meetings with the Ministry of Economic Development and with other organizations. These ideas apply to these changes. Some of the changes will be improved, definitely, and any criticism from anybody is most welcome, in particular from Ross Patent. And I think we'll meet with lots of criticism from you. But the idea is as follows. Since this area is similar to a Russian Federation entity, we should look into the norms, and we, there's a similar norm to, that applies to an entity of the Russian Federation. We would like to introduce a similar article in our laws that applies to our particular area that will regulate the name of our area. Moreover, we can make amendments in the law on the federal area. This, this will en en enable us to issue permits to use the word Sirius both in Cyrillic and Latin alphabet. But we also realize that this will create lots of collisions with other trademarks. And these collisions will either have to be solved or they will have to be kept left as they are. Since our target is to understand all the problems and issues that can arise after these laws are adopted, then our task would be to understand how to mitigate, to minimize the aftermath, the consequences in the other entities of the Russian Federation from such changes. We were also thinking to make the following amendment in the law. This is where the administration of the federal area would issue its permission to use the word permission in Cyrillic and Latin alphabet. It will issue these permissions to corporations and individuals. And here the question arises how to apply this all. If a company registers the name of Sirius to, uh, to a small cafe somewhere out there, can we forbid it? Or if a person launches a business and hangs a, a heading, then the person can say, I'm here in Sirius, then I can use this. So there are lots of problems, definitely. Lots of problems can occur. But there's also an idea to establish additional federal areas in the Russian Federation. This is why all these conflicts should be analyzed and this experience will be used, both in, the, in our federal area and elsewhere. Oh, well, this is basically all I have to say. Now, if our federal area series starts filing, uh, starts issuing such permissions, should it be carried out on a commercial basis or should it be free of charge? This is another area of conflicts where lots of wrong decisions may be made. So, if such conflicts arise, this will be an example of the case where lots of various changes should be made in orders, civil codes, other legal norms to be able to avoid such conflicts, to be able to authorize such areas to self-regulate. And to this end, changes have to be made even in federal level acts to be able to remove such conflicts. This is briefly it. It's quite uh, difficult and controversial topic, and I hope that we will, we will be able to analyze it throughout the coming years to, together with our colleagues from Ross Patent and from other state and government institutions. And we will definitely take into account the in interests of the residents of this area. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. And thank you for making your presentation quicker to be able to give the floor to the next speaker. Yes, the, yes Mr. Borovsky, uh, Zaborovsky, you have the floor. Yes, colleagues, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I will share my screen now. So I think you...
Видим. Can you? Yes, we can. So, colleagues, what is the main idea of my presentation? Why did I want to speak in your conference? I represent a community which is related to education. I'm professor at the University for Computer Sciences and Technologies of the Higher School of AI. So, so combination of AI and copyright offers us lots of questions to discuss. So create a system that would allow us on to automate a work, the work of expert teams on one hand, when such tasks are solved, tasks related to registration of IP. This is the area of our research that we have been undertaking for many years. So what is the idea? We deal here with a focus on industrial property, right? So, digital transformation clearly has had an impact on all the aspects of the technology process, but also on the social life. This is why we analyze here the outlooks and the problems related to the use of IT in order to automate processes related to the registration of intellectual property. What do you find important in this respect? First of all, we should understand that any automation is related to formalization. Formalization is based on mathematical models, and any mathematical models have very strict area, area of their applicability. So, if we start applying this without analyzing the consequences, it can happen that the problem of automation processes which are related to IP assets can face lots of problems. So, we would like to come up with a number of solutions that we would like to share with you. We would like to use some new definitions and terms, which, unlike the conventional terms, look at it from a different perspective. We call a system that we would like to create a system of exo-intellect rather than artificial intellect, because we demonstrate here that a hu humans' intellectual abilities are much more than any automated systems, no matter what sort of computers it would have. That said, our university has the country's second strongest capabilities, capabilities in terms of IT. So, the main thing we would like to share with you, dear colleagues, is that the declaration that a system can be created which would calculate and understand whether a particular IP asset can be registered, well, this is a task that can be fully resolved with automatic means. The thing is that when this expert examination is carried out, we see there are two aspects to the work of an expert. Some day-to-day -day routine work that can be automated, it is related to the processing of digital data and the ability to take a competent decision. From the point of view of present-day IT science, the issue of creating this automated system lies in the following. This uh, 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 availability of uh, intellectual property, is this something that can be calculated? And we believe that all present formalization based on equality uh, is based on equality, and intellectual activity is based on the concept of similarity, and it is the human intellect that can solve a task that can not be logically formalized. Intellectual property should be reviewed from the point of view of the fact that in the course of registering this IP asset, there are a number of steps that have to be made. Firstly, the IP is immaterial. Information about its novelty lies in the formula of the invention. Talking about that design is the design of this particular piece, item. So this logical approach, which we analyze in our work, lies in the following. The conventional approach to expert examination implies that there's an expert, an infrastructure, and a database, which help to make a, a qualified decision, but what needs to be automated asks for a certain black box that would classify the source data in the application, and then a final competent decision would be made. So we propose a number of approaches to the creation of such uh, objects form that can 
исходный материал для автоматизации. Технологических инвариантов, которые должны быть толерантны к различным взглядам на расположение, удобрение. Также важно понимать то, что capable of having all the stages automated, therefore it's an intellectual position that can be used as an extra element um, in addition to human operations that will help produce a number of routine operations and enhance the efficiency of our experts so that they can take legally important decisions within a shorter period of time and that will facilitate and speed streamline the Processes. From the mathematical point of view, there can be some result, some contradictions that are very hard to resolve, such as um, complicated uh, numerals, and it would take one object. And in terms of shape properties, we can use a variety of approaches to assess it. So this methodology and the the typology is, can be contradictory, so an object that we can see emerging in the magic can become an IP asset without this drastic change of its properties. So glorified statistics, this is all about data approximation that extra intellectual systems and as a conceptual basis can be used to pose the existing approach that it would take a machine so that its functions can be divided into the things that it can do, such as algorithms that are separated from creativity, so because the algorithms are results, but not at this source, plus knowledge, that is sharing of knowledge, of information, and target setting. So we are working on the automation of typological options that would be combined some networks and then producing variants and lines that reduce the range and also um, produce some st statistical solutions. So we are trying to reach those solutions that will enable experts from the federal industrial property institutions I mean, to work better and to reduce their time for routine operations so that they could perform their competent and expert functions with a higher degree of efficiency. So for instance, we receive an application for some part of a vertical, so this can be also processes within our system, then we can use the criteria of similarity, and this replication will be compared to other categories, and then we can produce the outcomes both in the form of a chart and in the form of a graph. So this is the intellectual system that has two components. The first component that is formalized, and the second component is the responsibility of people with human intellectuals because these are the neuron, neurons and these neural networks can be adjusted as they run. So better results will be achieved and then the outcomes of the results will be produced and delivered to the experts so they can take their final decisions on the matters at hand. So this is the first approach <coughs> formalizing intellectual property objects for automation. So, and again, as a result, we will see that this will help experts in their work. Next, we will have the digitalization of the processes and transfer overrides can be automated by blockchain, so tokens through technologies. We will also provide a competent database and a database that will accumulate 
all these products and it can also be commercialized. It can be transferred as a product in the market and next we will also provide solutions for processing ideas linked to this concept of intellectual activity that is also part of intellectual property within our academic research team and I think this can be considered as a new area of our activity and um, on that I would like to thank you for listening so thank you very much and that your presentation has been very exciting and brief so and right you are so it's better to be brief because um, now we can do more things and I would like to say that we have we are concluding the first session and we're going to have a break till half past two at half past two we will split into several sections two sections section number one so we'll proceed in this room and then then section number two will go to office number nine in the same building and bon appetit and see you at half past two.